This is like the most default carry. I would tell anybody to practice if they're new to carry roll. It allows you to do everything. Survivably farm, split push, kill threat. Everything you ask for a solo carry type hero. And it helps you learn the limits of playing aggressively. I would say if I'm a newer player to Jug and I'm just starting out. And I had to build the same items every single game. So that I can practice that idea. And before I'm worried about the conceptual aspects of the hero. I'm going to just build the same items every single game for my own sake. I would probably go Treads with double rate treads rape and wand in any particular order so probably wand rape band into treads i'd go into battle fury then manta treads battle fury manta basher into shadow blade into abyssal into silver edge into butterfly or scotty or ags that would probably be my build every single game banana slam Jam. Welcome back. This is a uh, the second hero guide that we'll, we will be doing for 35,000 subscribers. Please note, everybody, that for every 5,000 subscribers I get on YouTube, I will be doing a hero guide, uh, at least for the foreseeable future. So right now, we a Twitch chat voted on Juggernaut as our second hero. And so we're going to be talking about exactly what I believe to think about when you're picking Jug, when playing Jug, and any other things I can kind of come up with that apply to me whenever I am playing Jug. So... First and foremost, we're going to talk about the strengths and weaknesses of Juggernaut. I think the strengths of Jug are that he's a super stable hero. If he has a rough start, he can kind of spin his way back uh, with decent farm. He's survivable, so he can usually play pretty independently. And if he has a strong start, he can look to take objectives. He can look to fight relatively early. And he can even look for some kill threat with his Omni Slash. Uh, the strengths of Jug, or the weaknesses of Jug is that uh, they do mess with his like base damage and base movement speed a lot, and sometimes the hero's just not viable enough in lanes. And the hero kind of just falls off if he loses momentum. So he's like a semi-carry that can like potentially go late game, if uh, depending on the game, but most games he kind of falls off. Uh, they've given him new items such as the Ag Scepter with a short Omni Slash. They've buffed his Omni Slash so it doesn't get disjointed by Manta. And these things help him go later into the game, but... At the end of the day, if this hero loses momentum, he can kind of just be underwhelming. I would deem him one of the most stable carries in all of Dota. He's just got everything. He's got a survivability mechanic. He's got a team mechanic in the healing ward. He's got a built-in damage mechanic with the crit. And he's also got like a high-impact ulti that can kind of just melt people. He offers a lot to learn in terms of Dota. You can learn you know, how to play aggressive with kill threat. You can learn how to farm aggressively with survivability. You can learn how to dodge fights and split push because he does effectively threaten objectives on the map if if left alone. And you can also look, you know, learn how to go these mid game items where you go like an early defusal and you you look to fight early with your team. Uh, so the key, in my opinion, to Jug a lot of times, especially at the higher level, is really learning when you want to go for the late game and when you want to be that early game presence that you could be. A lot of times it's based on my teammates, meaning that if I have a teammate that picks, you know, a mid farming hero that wants to be more passive, I'll oftentimes go for that more mid game aggression build, maybe like that defusal, maybe like the old drums. You don't really go drums much right now, but if they, you know, buff drums back into relevance for this hero, I could easily go those. I, I used to go drums all the time on Jug. He capitalizes a lot on movement speed, some basic attack speed, uh in the early to mid game and he's perfectly fine to build one small team item because of the fact that he can participate in these early fights i think one of the most common scenarios i find myself with jug is that he's very survivable if ganked by one or two heroes but he's very weak in the mid game five on fives uh the most of the time that i participate in 5v5s or like early to mid game fights is either when i have a super hard farmer in the mid lane or when the opponent has a super hard farmer, such as like an anti-mage or a PA, like a hero that doesn't want to be in fights. Because my weakness as a hero is if they have like an Ursa, you know, or like a Terror Blade with meta in the mid game, I do die to that physical damage. I do die if that carry shows up. That's most of the damage that kills me is physical because of spin. So a lot of times my ability to participate in mid game fights is predicated upon what carry is on the opponent team. Uh, and how much they actually threaten me. So with Jug, I like to consider if there's any item that makes me more survivable. Uh, his spin is a BKB, ignoring the fact that you can't cast it when silenced. 
So when I look to buy stuff like Manta, I think, hey, it's because I'm worried about getting silenced. And I, it's basically a BKB for me. And uh, I also look to buy, you know, Diffusal if I want to be super aggressive early. I look to buy Maelstrom if I want to be aggressive, but I also know I need to farm. I look to buy Battle Fury if I think I can fight anyways, or if I, like, if I buy one, or I don't think I have to fight. Uh, a lot of games where I think I'm really strong when I'm farming, but really weak when I'm fighting, I'll usually go for a Battle Fury, because I think I need, like, two or three items before I'm ready to fight anyway. Uh, but the most important thing when I am farming is that I'm not just farming really passively. There's very few games, very few games on Jug that I'll ever be farming super passively. I'll almost always be taking the dangerous farm in my own safe lane uh, past like the 10 minute mark because I know I'm not killable if they have no BKB piercing stuns. Or I'll be looking to constantly pressure the opponent dead lane in the safe lane. Uh, there's even times that I casually rotate to the opponent mid lane if the opponent's, you know, making a move on some other lane. Uh, the point is I almost always farm in a way that puts myself at risk or poises me to take an objective. That's almost what I, that's all, like what I always want to do on Jug. Because it's just so convenient for him to tank a tower like a tier 1 while having a healing ward behind him and keeping his creep wave alive. That's like a nice mechanic you can pull off his Jug. It's like a very, he's just a very good hero for practicing his like constant pressure idea. I have a replay already analysis of Miracle on YouTube where he went for, <clears throat> excuse me, he went for a Radiance. And that was a game where he his teammate had a lot of physical damage. The cool thing about Jug is he has a ton of different builds. If your team needs some catch, Diffusal's great. Your team needs some, like, vision in the early, mid to late game, fourth item Shadow Blade. You know, your team needs that stun late game, Abyssal. You know, they have a hero like Morphling that is really hard to kill through his sustain. You can go Scotty. You know, these there's so many different options for Jug. He kind of just builds either something he needs to survive or something that gives him kill threat or something that just makes it harder for the opponent to play. And I think a lot of people don't realize that Jug, sometimes the best win condition is just to be able to hit buildings. Like, that's what I really like to be able to do. Jug's one of the best high grounders in the game because you can spin and hit buildings. And uh, when I look to pick him, I, I usually envision a way that my hero is going to walk up to the high ground and end the game. Uh, if it's a hero like Anti-Mage, I won't chase them around. I'll kind of just farm and get my level, get my items while taking objectives. Because the benefit of Jug in these matchups is that he threatens objectives and they don't. So, that's like a general premise of like what I like about Jug and what I think about Jug as a hero. Now, we're going to talk at the more basic level. I know I could go in a different order here, but I like to kind of give my summary of, of what I view as Jug when I think about the hero. So, let's go into skills and uh, leveling in general. I would say the majority of games you're going to take spin level 1. There's some rare exceptions where you don't really need spin for survivability, and you can make use of your crit when attacking the guy. Uh, I'd say, as of right now, spin's usually the best build, but just knowing if, if you don't need it and you can look to trade with the guy, crit is, yeah, 16% effective damage level 1. So, if you're hitting the guy 5 times, you're going to do an extra 8 damage a hit. So that's nice. Uh, including, not even including the stout shield block, so it'll actually be more. But so, uh, just giving you some maths there, something to think about. Uh, when it comes to skill build, I usually level healing ward at four. Usually. Meaning in an ideal scenario, I have two points spin, and I have one point in blade dance. But your healing ward is basically a salve, right? So, uh, the, they've nerfed healing ward a lot in the past, where it's it's really easy for the opponent to kill it. And it does supply 75 gold and XP to the opponent when they kill it, which is pretty massive if you just feed that away in the laning stage. So it's become less enticing for you to want to let level it early, but if you can sit behind your tower and effectively salve yourself, then the healing ward can be really nice for that. And if that's something you need in lane, you shouldn't be hesitant to level it at 3, because it doesn't matter if you can use your spin if you don't have any health. <laughs> so uh, really important there. If you think you're in a lane that you're likely to use healing ward, you can easily consider a Mango as one of your starting items. If you're not going to use Healing Ward in that lane, I usually don't go ma Mango. There's a lot of starting items that you can go for Jug. Pretty much Quelling Blade every game. I like to go Tangos in the current meta, just because of Towers giving you armor and regen. Usually you can treat, if you think you need a Salve, you can just buy a Mango, which is like a cheaper version of a Salve, and it gives you the Healing Ward. Uh, so I usually very rarely go Salves on Jug. Not saying you can't ever go salves, but I very rarely do. And if they were to change the tower mechanic, uh, that tango rule might 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 change a bit. His only problems early is that he does have relatively low base damage, but his attack animation is great. 
So when I'm in lane, I like to capitalize on the fact that I have a low base attack time of 1.4, and I also have a great attack animation. So any time that the opponent is far enough away that I could attack a creep twice before they get there, I try to use that as a way to secure CS for myself. Because a lot of offlaners will have more damage than you, but they won't be able to attack fast enough to uh, punish you attacking a creep twice. So that's something I like to use a lot. Whenever going into a lane, I like to think, you know, what is the threat of my spin? You know, how, how much impact does this spin have? And if I'm going to play around the spin, I usually need to wait until it's level 2 or 3 leveled. At least level 2, usually level 3. Like, I'm not going to build boots just because I want to make use of my spin if I'm only level 1, because my spin is such a long cooldown. Right? Uh, every game I max spin. I don't think there's ever been an exception for me. There were like one patch a while back where it's like 114 was the build and you built Mask of Madness. But nowadays, I think your spin is just so good. I, I see no reason why this ability, it goes down in mana cost, down in cooldown, up in damage. You know, like it's just such a well scaling ability. It helps you farm. It helps you kill people. And I just love the scaling of this ability too much where at level 7, I'm pretty much always 411. Sometimes 402... Maybe in a crazy world, I put that extra point in Healing Ward. It does go up by 50% from level 1 to 2. So if I'm really struggling for sustain in the lane, I could consider a second point in Healing Ward. I don't really think of a situation where I don't level my ult at 6. Pretty much always do that. Um, when it comes to maxing Healing Ward or Blade Dance after the Blade Fury, I pretty much always go with... This is when I'm primarily farming. This is when I'm fighting. So it's just like, how much am I fighting... This also helps you push towers, and this doesn't, right? Because you can't crit towers. So it's like fighting in towers, farming, right? And then I just gauge how much of that am I doing um, and between levels 7 to 10, because that's when I'm choosing to max one of these. Um, and that, that will always dictate uh, which one I take. And it's just a balance. If you think you're doing a little bit of both, maybe you're 4 2, two by level 9. Uh, so here we go. Looking at talents, obviously these could change... Movement speed, if I think I'm playing evasive. Stats, if I'm concerned about getting bursted. Attack speed, most of the time, if I'm going the Radiance build, maybe I'd consider, consider the movement speed on Blade Fury. If I'm going Radiance build, Blade Fury DPS. If I'm going any other build, probably armor. Uh, I would say I default to health, but if you're not afraid of dying, like they don't have enough damage to kill you because you have, you know, Scotty S and Y, Satanic or something then obviously Omni Slash Duration at that point is better because 475 health when you have that much, really not that impactful. The major thing for me when I look at the items for Jug, it's important to note with Battle Fury that uh, you can't hit people while you're spinning anymore. You used to be able to. You used to cleave while you were spinning. Meaning if I was spinning and I was hitting this creep, every creep behind it would be cleaved. But now, I don't cleave anymore on any of the creeps behind me. But, the nice thing is when it comes to items, I still mana burn. Like, if I look at this range creep, I'm still mana burning it. And the mana burn does damage. If I have a maelstrom, it's still dealing maelstrom procs. Okay, I finally got one. <laughs> uh, the point is that with Battle Fury, a lot of times when I'm deciding between Battle Fury and Maelstrom, I'm thinking to myself how much in fights I'm going to have to spend. Uh, sometimes, as Jug, you can't walk into the fight and spin. A lot of times with Battle Fear, you'll need that, like, 5th or 6th item BKB because you can't hit anything when you're spinning. Uh, on the other hand, Mjolnir, obviously, you can't. Same with Defusal. Same with Basher. Same with Scotty. All of these items effectively do their job while you're spinning. Um, but the right clicks themselves do no damage. It's really important to note that while you're spinning, you can hit buildings. Anything that is not affected by your spin other than BKB heroes can be hit while you're, hit it, while you're spinning. So keeping that in mind is really important. I think an important mechanic to learn when you're using spin is the move command. So you should, if you play Jug, you should have this command as a hockey. Move command. For me, it's Alt-S. So like if I want to, the move command allows me, so if I'm following somebody, if he's running away and I don't have the move command and I want to be as close to him as possible, I have to not attack him. Like I have to literally run around him and not attack him. Like if I click him once, I'll stop and attack, right? Let's go ahead and drop our items here. But if I have the move command and he's running away, I can just move command him. And I'll just follow him. So it's really efficient on Jug to utilize the move command. Super important hero to do it. When it comes to people juking you in the trees with spin, this is something that'll often happen. 
So if he's going to run through these trees, I'll usually click as close to me as possible. Because if I click here and he's blocking my path, my hero's just going to run the other way. Like, I'm just going to do... Like, if he's right here and I click here, my hero's going to go like this, trying to get there. So I usually try to click as close to myself as possible whenever I'm chasing people through the trees with my spin. Uh, to prevent myself from clicking past them and running the opposite way. To note that you do, if you do lose vision of them when move commanding, you stop following them. There you go. Perfect. Perfect execution, BSJ. First time you, first try. Um, so yeah, if you lose vision of them, you'll stop move commanding. So if you're going to use the move command to follow them, that's why I mentioned the jukes through the trees. It's very important that the minute you're going to lose vision, you keep chasing with your right clicks. It's important to know you can cast spin after you TP. So, like, you don't have to spin, then TP. You can just start your TP and then spin. So, if you thought you didn't have to spin TP and you see someone coming, you're like, oh, shit. You can just spin TP like that. When I'm playing the lane, I like to think about CS, like, as a way of threatening my spin. The way to play Jug properly, in my opinion, is to have his spin as more of a threat than actually just spamming it. A lot of weaker Jug players that I watch, like, at the lower MMRs, if they see the guy walk up, they'll always just spin. They'll just be like, oh shit, get him! You know? And I'm very careful about using my spin near a creep wave. Because a lot of times, I need that chase range to make use of my spin damage. So if I push the lane into his tower super early, I don't have that threat. So what I like to do as a jug, especially when I'm like level 5-ish, maybe even level 6, I like to zone them away from the creep wave with my spin. Like, I like to use my spin as a deterrent where if they choose to fight back on me i will spin so like if this guy is right here i walk at him like this and if he starts hitting me i'll be like oh what are you doing and then i'll spin it right but if if he starts walking away from me i'll just hit him right i'll just be like oh get away from me get away from me and then i'll keep harassing them so i look to use my spin as more of a threat than to use it just off cooldown to harass it's not enough to just harass people with your spin you want to set them up to die with your spin by consistently threatening your right clicks and the matchups where Jug is good in lane are the ones where he's allowed to right-click them without being afraid. The ones where he's bad is usually where they have, like, two stuns and you don't feel comfortable hitting the guy unless you're spinning. Uh, those type of lanes, I'll pick Jug for the game if I'm really survivable and accept that I'm probably going to kind of lose the lane. But um, I'll usually pick him in lanes where I can aggressively use my spin if I'm trying to win the lane as Jug. Like, if I'm picking Jug for the laning stage... That's what's in my mind. Uh, I like to pick Jug mainly in games where it's like, if I can spin TP, it's immunity. That's like the dream, especially in low MMRs. This is like the perfect hero to solo carry games in low MMRs. Because you can be cutting waves behind tier 2s. You can be doing all kinds of crazy stuff with your farm. You can farm anywhere you want as long as you have a spin TP out. Uh, I think a topic I kind of forgot about, and if the YouTube editor wants to, he can maybe put this earlier in the video, is what Jug does with an advantage early. I think it's really important that uh, you know Jug's all about that constant pressure. The hero plays on pretty low cooldowns. Yeah, your Omni Slash is a long cooldown, but all that means for you is you can't kill the guy. That doesn't mean you're any less powerful as a hero that's farming and survivability and all that. On Jug, once I get like level 5 or 6, I usually ask myself, because I'm thinking level 3 spin and level 4 spin are nice power spikes for the hero, I usually just ask myself how comfortable I am playing the lane. If I spin the lane and back off, am I survivable? Uh, if I farm underneath my tower, am I survivable? Jug almost always operates best at that point by consistently shoving in the lane to the tower and then farming the jungle. Like, that's almost always what he wants to do. Or farming the jungle and then defending his tower because he's usually able to do one or the other. And it's almost always done by maximizing spin. Like, just always spinning whenever you can. The only reason you wouldn't is if you use it and you run into somebody, you're going to die. And the times where you pressure tower is usually just with the catapult or when the opponent's gone. You usually just want to force them to come back. Like you're like this AFK farmer, but you're not AFK because you're forcing the opponent to react to you. And if they react, then you can like go back to the jungle and farm. But I think if you're not forcing those reactions, like if you push lane into their tower and nobody's there and they don't threaten kill threat on you and you're not pushing the tower, that's like playing too passively as a joke. Uh, you should almost always feel safe showing up on the tower, unless they have multiple stuns that kill you, or like a carry like Ursa. A lot of times how aggressively I play on that enemy's offlane tower is based on the threat of rotations. 
if I picked Jug into something like Slardar, I, I shouldn't have done that in the first place, but I'm probably also not going to push his tower. Most of the heroes that threaten me, though, are from the enemy safe lane. But obviously there are some off laners and mid laners that do threaten you. I like, uh, obviously, since Jug's main source of survivability is spin, I like to avoid picking him into heavy physical damage lineups, high armor cores. He's mostly physical damage, and he's obviously susceptible to physical damage. So cores like Terrorblade, cores like Slardar, they can be very annoying to play into because they basically make you uh, die despite having this innate survivability mechanic. Supports that scare me the most are Venge. Venge has two TP cancels with her double swap charge. And she also has minus armor and represents a lot of physical damage for her team. Uh, so when I think of the opponent, I think they lack single target physical damage. That's like the perfect game to pick Jug. No big AB piercing stuns, and they lack single target physical damage. I don't like them against cores like TA. I don't like them against Wyvern, who prevents me from uh, killing her teammates, killing her, and she can stun me through spin TP. Uh, I ideally don't pick him against Bane because of the Fiend's Grip, but that's not necessarily nearly as bad. All the ones that stop me from killing their team and the ones that threaten me are the ones that I really am scared of picking Jug into. Uh, the Dream Jug games are against heroes like Jakiro and uh, Ember Spirit. They have these abilities that don't do anything to you because you can just react. You know, you get changed by Ember, you spin. You see a Jakiro casting Ice Path, you spin. You know, these are the type of heroes I love playing against. I'm a little bit more fearful to play against the Lions of the world, the Shadow Shamans, because they have insta-spell, insta-cast insta stuns that kill me, or like lock me down. I want to be able to walk around in fights and reactionarily spin, similar to the way that Slark wants to reactionarily pack and is bad against heroes that stun you through Dark Pact. I like to think of my survivability as whatever spin does for me. And my first item as Jug will usually be an efficiency item. Whether or not that's Battle Fury, whether or not that's Drums, you know, like something like Yasha. Uh, it'll usually be some item that makes me move around the map faster or be a faster farmer, Maelstrom. Uh, and my next item will almost always be survivability. SNY and Manta. SNY represents status resistance, at least in the current patch, that allows me to tank through that initial volley with less duration and then get my spin off. While Manta's like, they're going to use something like a Silence or a Root on me that I either don't want to cast Spin to remove, like the Root, or I want to be able... It basically treats my Manta like a BKB, right? Um, in the later stages of the game, because of what I talked about with the fact that your actual right-click damage doesn't go through Spin, I look at BKB as an item that allows me to actually just right-click people. Uh, if I don't need it for survivability early, because my Manta represents that BKB for me, great. But in the later stages of the game where your right-click damage is massive, uh, you do sometimes just need to be able to right-click. So that's why you'll see BKBs on Jug sometimes. Your ult is a purge. I think that's really important to realize. So if you're able to cast your ult, um, all things will be dispelled from you. Roots, and this includes your axe. So if you're primarily dealing with roots, like CMs and Treants and stuff, or Atos... Uh, and you're not getting silenced, your Ags is actually a really nice survivability item. So I would consider even going like Battle Fury Manta Ags or Battle Fury Yasha Ags. You know, uh, the Ags is a nice luxury item if you can use it for its survivability part of it. What it does lack is damage, though. So your Ags really only really scales well with you doing enough damage to be a threat. I think I see a lot of Jugs go for this like random ass smorgasbord of items that make them not a threat on the game. They'll go for like Diffusal S and Y Ags, and I'm just like, who's scared of you? Why would you do that? Nobody's going to die to you. So when I'm Jug and I'm thinking about like opponent items and stuff and what helps me do my job in the game, first and foremost, be survivable. If they have an Orchid Builder, I'm almost always going to build a Manta in prep. If they have heroes that jump me and if I get jumped, I'm going to die. I like Shadow Blade a lot. I hardly ever go Lincolns. You know, I have four here just for the stats and regen, but hardly ever go Lincolns. I think, I think the only time I'd go Lincolns if it's my job to end the game and they have like a bat rider who I just can't push high ground into unless I have a Lincolns. Uh, I think Lincolns is probably the biggest bait item on Jug. If you're afraid of getting initiated onto, just buy a sh just buy a Shadow Blade. Uh, it's a very nice item for the hero. It allows you to scout the map more aggressively. It allows you to get the jump. You can go like Shadow Blade Abyssal. Um, and when I'm looking at the opponent's items, I'm thinking, you know, are these blink mobile heroes to catch me? 
Are they? Do they have glimmer capes so that I have to detect them and buy dust during my Omni Slash? I'm mainly concerned about anything that survives my Omni Slash. Ghost Scepters, Yule Scepters, Glimmers. Um, it used to be Manta, but now it's not anymore, at least for now. Um, so I like to go into fights in the mid-game thinking, who dies to my Omni Slash? You know, it's all physical damage. And uh, I'm thinking to myself, I want to be able to Omni Slash someone reliably. If they're stunned, will they die? You know, what is their mechanic of survivable? And I, I just like to have a general idea of what I'm going to use my Omni Slash for. In fights, in pickoffs, all that kind of stuff. Sometimes the threat of Omni Slash is actually stronger uh, than the Omni Slash itself. And I think that's an important skill to recognize. Meaning that there's some heroes in the game that can't enter the fight until you've Omni Slashed. And if you just Omni Slash for the sake of killing somebody and suddenly that hero is allowed to enter the fight now, it's kind of similar to Doom, where, you know, if I'm a Slark, I'll never enter the fight as long as that Doom has Doom, but the minute he Dooms, I'm just going to run in. Uh, and that just comes down to, like, what heroes on their team are going to die to your Omni. I love them against Invoker. Um, I love them against any magic damage heroes that you can just spin off all their crap. Obviously, high armor, high physical damage heroes, we've expressed that a lot. Clinks can be annoying. Troll can be annoying. Ursa can be annoying. Slark can be annoying, but if you're allowed to group up as five, Slark, not a big deal. Monkey King's annoying. PA's annoying. But all these other heroes, for the most part, faces Void because he stuns through BKB, but meh. Ricky's not too bad either because you can, like, Manta off his defusal and get out of his cloud. Um, but notice all the heroes I'm pointing out that are tough matchups. I don't like playing him into Drow. Heavy single target physical damage, and it all goes through armor, right? Sven's annoying because of the AoE war cry, but he's not really a hero in this current meta, but he can be annoying. Deso plus Mask of Madness potential. Uh, you don't have to always go both, and uh, they don't have to go together necessarily, but uh, they both kind of synergize with the same concept. Mask of Madness is this early game sustain item that amps up the damage of your ultimate. I've never been a huge fan of this playstyle. I do see what it offers, uh, that initial solo kill potential, the sustained farming for yourself. Uh, the drawbacks of that build are that you don't give yourself any survivability and you oftentimes turn yourself into a more fragile version of what you already are. Because Juggernaut's main weakness is single target physical damage in the first place, Mask of Madness, I believe, makes that worse in most games. Uh, when I'm not necessarily afraid of their single target physical damage, that's when I would much more lean towards the Mask of Madness build. And if you really want to all in uh, on the physical damage... If you go like the whole Phase Boots, Double Wraith Band, Mask of Madness into Deso, uh, I think that's reasonable, but the only thing I could really see it being followed up by is an Aghanim Scepter, because your ultimate's not reliable enough to bank on all of that physical damage. You don't really have a way to reliably survive while you're just hitting people, and uh, I think the Ags would be the only thing that enables you to utilize those items. So, uh, just another way to play Jug, but that's not my preferred playstyle. I like to play them as a survivable objective split pusher, but if there's games where maybe you can't show on the map anyway, or maybe you can't enter fights easily anyway, or you're just super survivable despite having a Mask of Madness, those are the games that I would consider buying it. The way I play Jug is pretty much dependent on the opponent carry. If it's a hero I'm content to farm against, I'll usually go for that Battle Fury. And Battle Fury is usually accompanied with Treads. You almost always need one Wraith Band, Wand, Super Value item on Jug. His mana pool problems are significant. Treads are like more about the farming. Phase are more about the aggressive run around the map play. Whether or not that's for the lane, whether or not that's for the game. I would say right now I would default to Treads. I would prefer to buy Treads. But if I need the Phase for the mobility and the armor, not necessarily the armor, more so the mobility, I'll go for the Phase. Uh, if you want to go like Yasha before Battle Fury... It's because maybe you're looking to take those like early towers and threaten some objectives a bit quicker and then go back for the farming item. But I usually just ask myself, am I content just farming against that hero? Do I scale well against this hero? If it's like an illusion-based carry, I'm usually happy to farm, but I'm not happy to not have anything happening in the game. I'm usually trying to threaten objectives. So if I need to threaten objectives like towers and Roche... I usually will buy the bare minimum of items that I think I need to do that. Like I said against PA and Anti-Mage, I'm happy to just go Battle Fury and still run around the map fighting. But against other lineups, I may need those mid-game items to force those objectives. And then maybe I can look to go back for that farming item if I absolutely need to. 
Uh, there's a, I think the skill that comes with Jug is really adjusting from game to game. He pretty much always plays the opponent dead lane. Like, he pretty much always plays the top half of the map when he's Radiant. He pretty much always plays the bottom half of the map when he's Dire. That emphasis on being poised to threaten an objective at any point, I think, is super awesome on Jug. If you're going to play the dangerous part of the map, it's almost always because you can spin TP. So usually I look to spin TP a Creep Wave because that's the part of the map I'm playing to relieve pressure. And if I'm playing there to relieve pressure, that's the best way Jug can do it. Um, and the only time I will play that part of the map is when I'm survivable enough to do so, I'm content with no objectives being taken, and or somebody else on my team is going to take the objectives for me. You know, I have an offlane Beastmaster that can take the objectives if I'm not there. So I'm more served as a defensive hero. The point is that the hero has options. He can play ultra defensive, he can play ultra aggressive, and it's all dependent upon his own survivability and the scaling of his hero in the game. And uh, my favorite cores to pick him into are like the gyrocopters of the world. I really don't mind picking him into Slark if like your team's allowed to group up. Uh, I love picking him into like Luna, PL, Lifestealer. Those are probably the most notable carry matchups that I would pick him into. He just feels good against those heroes because they don't really threaten him. Spectre, uh, the healing ward, very nice against Spectre. If you're stuck in any of those other matchups, like against Ursa, I like Manta because he's heavy single target physical damage, and that helps me alleviate that. Uh, I just like to think, you know, what can I do to alleviate this problem with Faces Void type heroes that are very survivable against you. I like to go to Fusel a lot of the time. Anti-Mage, I also like to go to Fusel if I feel like I have to be the one killing him. So I'll either go like Battle Fury into a ton of damage items and luxury items for myself. Or I'll go like the Manta to Fusel and look to be that kill threat on Anti-Mage. I don't like him into the Sphins, the CKs, you know, the Terror Blades, the Trolls, the Ursas, the Razor. Ah, Razor's fine, I guess. Uh... PA, Monkey King, all these single target physical damage. I'm going to repeat myself a bit because I want to make sure that's rehashed. I really do want to emphasize Jug's strength in a 1v1 scenario. There's very few heroes that, when pinned up against him 1v1 while they're farming, win that. There's very few. Whether or not that's in the laning stage, whether or not that's uh, while you're just farming the map. And that's an important skill to recognize as Jug. When you can just walk at towers and hit them. When you can just walk at creep waves with another hero on them, like that, an, an opponent hero there, and you just hit them. Know what a dead lane is? Uh, whether or not you can just push out the lane and then go farm and then come back. Uh, the hero giving up space to the opponents is a lot of his limitation. A lot of the biggest issue I have with Jug players is them just farming like pussies. There's some times where you have to. You know, if you're against an Ursa Slardar, sure, you should be a little bit scared. But if they don't have a reliable way to kill you quick with physical damage and you're playing scared in terms of your farming, you're not a hero that generally relegates himself to the triangle. You know, that's not something that you're normally going to do. That's the safest part on the map. That's not what Jug's usually farming. Uh, that's a big skill to have as Jug, really pushing your limits, making sure you feel like uh, you're playing as aggressively as you can, not only where you are on the map, but also like how you play that side of the map. So I want you to play your opponent objectives at all times. And anytime I have Omni Slash, I'm kind of just thinking, what hero is most threatened by my Omni Slash? And I'm going to kind of put myself on the same part of the map that he's on. Uh, and it's not necessarily that I have to Omni Slash that guy, but if I can make it so the opponent Gyro doesn't want to play that part of the map because I'm sitting in his lane with Omni Slash already, that's effectively making him farm less and I'm being more powerful on the map. Like a lot of Jug's power comes from the fact that it takes like four heroes to kill them a lot of the times and that there's a lot of heroes that can't just tank your omni slash and they're gonna die right um so simply forcing that many heroes to deal with you and then getting out like by the skin of your teeth is great like that's like the perfect way to play jug but also like following heroes around the map that die to your omni slash is another potent way to farm with jug if i'm practicing jug He's a great hero to practice my solo carry command that I have on my Twitch stream. It basically says that you want to be able to threaten objectives, potentially represent solo kill threat, be a survivable split pusher, and be able to participate in mid-game teamfights. I would say if I'm a newer player to Jug and I'm just starting out, and I had to build the same items every single game so that I can practice that idea, and before I'm worried about the conceptual aspects of the hero, I'm going to just build the same items every single game for my own sake. I would probably go Treads with double Wraith... Treads, Wraithband, Wand in any particular order. So probably Wand, Wraithband into Treads. I'd go into Battle Fury, 
Vid Manta, Treads, Battle Fury Manta, Asher, into Shadow Blade, into Abyssal, into Silver Edge, into Butterfly or Scotty or Ags. That would probably be my build every single game. And once I ate the Ags, you know, I'd get the others, you know. Butterfly, Scotty. Butterfly, if you're worried about physical right click damage. Scotty, if you're worried about, obviously, magical burst damage. Um, also, at this current patch, it reduces regen, so if you have the mana on some hero like Gyro with a Satanic, this can be really nice as well. But that would be my ideal build. Treads. Gives you that mana early for tread swapping to use your uh, spin to farm. Great for speeding up your Battle Fury timing. Obviously, Battle Fury just gives Jug everything he wants in an ideal circumstance, except for survivability. But it gives you that farming steroid that this hero farms like, uh, like a nutcase when he has Battle Fury. Manta will almost always give you the survivability that you need. Shadow Blade or Basher, the the order of that depends upon... Shadow Blade lets you play more elusively on the map, while Basher gives you the ability to cancel, like, BKB TPs or just threaten people in general. Or just TPs in general. Um, if I think I can just walk at the opponent heroes, I'm going to go Basher before Shadow Blade. If I think I need a, to be invis to walk at them... And make it harder Hi, for them BSJ, to take fights. A lot of the time where I am scared of the cores as the primary primary way to initiate onto me, I do favor Shadow Blade. Like if I'm dealing with like an Abyssal Blade Ursa, Shadow Blade can be a huge uh, bolster to me as like a fourth, fifth item. Because a lot of cores at that stage don't have an item slot to buy detection. So it requires like a support tracking you down or like placing sentries ahead of time. But the combined aspect of Silver Edge and Abyssal, it's a lot of damage, it's a pretty good amount of health, and it's a huge kill threat, obviously. You're, you're Invis, and then you can Abyssal somebody and kill them. Uh, and then that last item, like I said, is kind of just addressing whatever the opponent has. You know, Butterfly gives you nice damage and survivability against right clicks. Scotty gives you decent stats as well as the survivability against magic. And then an item like MKB if you need it for the evasion uh, that the opponent has. Rapier if you're just desperate. A soul cuirass if you're against like drows and stuff where you need that extra armor and i'd say that's really the main item you're gonna go for uh you can go for sanj and yasha instead of manta but like i said manta's basically a bkb for this hero because it allows you to spin through silences the specision threes that i like to pick myself into are heroes like bat rider heroes like tide hunter brewmaster Sometimes a badden. Underlord, if I'm not afraid of my team having damage issues, because I never die to Underlord. Sand King. Pangolier. I think what you're noticing about all these heroes is they don't kill you when you spin. If you spin, you just don't give a shit that they exist. Those are the heroes I would like to pick Jug into. I like, them, I like to pick them into supports that can't defend themselves. Preferably ones, like I said, I can just kind of spin off whatever they do. Crystal Maidens. Jakiros. Coddle. Shadow Shaman, kind of, but not really. Silencer, I love it. Skyrath Mage, no problem, because you just buy Manta and you don't die to him. Witch Doctor, great. Undying, great. Bounty Hunter, great. These heroes just don't threaten you, right? Um, when you're dealing with BKB Piercing Stuns, when you're dealing with instant disables, instant silences, those can be a bit annoying. I don't like picking him into Dazzle. That's minus armor that goes through BKB, and it's also a hero that like groups up with his team and makes you have damage issues. The two major concerns with Jug are your own survivability and your own scaling and damage. Uh, there's very few heroes that have that give you the damage problem, but I do consider that with like the Underlords, the Dazzles, the Kunkas, um, the Terrorblades. You know, these heroes that are either super heavy on the damage reduction for you, or the heroes that are just so tanky your physical damage doesn't matter. Like, the reason I don't mind him in a Spectre is Jug is a great Silver Edge builder, and once you're in the late game, Silver Edge is pretty damn good against Spectre. And obviously the healing ward for the sustain against it. I love him against Zeus. I love him against Ember. Any of these AoE poke damage from long-range heroes are super nice to play Jug into. Most of them can't kill your healing ward very well, and most of them rely on that consistent harass when you're base pushing, when you're fighting... Venomancer, giving you so many examples of these heroes that want to sit and like poke you down. I love Jug against those heroes. He helps your entire team play well against those heroes, and it just alleviates that sustain issue that your team has in that specific case. Jug's healing ward really is predicated upon how easily they can kill it. 
They have like long range heroes like Willow or Wyvern. Those heroes are super annoying to have your healing ward into. So when I'm pushing high ground, my healing ward usage or pushing buildings, I have to ask myself, can I use it and then hit the building with the healing ward behind me? Or do I have to hit the building so I'm down to half health and then back off in healing ward? Those are like the two options there. That's a big deal when it comes to your use of healing ward. When it comes to hockeys, I usually have hockeys for Manta. So I'll have, I haven't set them on my main account recently. I'll have my first hockey for Manta Illusions. I'll have one for my healing ward. So I can control my illusions. I can control my healing ward. Your healing ward obviously default follows you. But I'll try to sit it in the back, and it'll be depending upon what my hero's survivability is. Like, if I'm just clicking somebody, sometimes in fights, the right way to play is to click somebody and have my healing ward being micro behind me as I'm Kinsen clicking. Because my hero's not actually at threat of dying. So, they're like, it's all about priority. What's more important, your hero or your healing ward? If your hero's not going to die, I actually think your healing ward's more important. Um, assuming you are, like, clicking somebody at, the, at that given moment. Obviously, Healing Ward's amazing for Roche. I didn't really talk much about Healing Ward, but it's just a spell that I think is incredibly underutilized. You can use it to tank towers in the early game. I said that earlier, but I think that's super important to consider. Uh, whenever you're pushing towers, most towers have some tree crevice that you can put them in. So, like, say this tower was here and you want to do this, okay. and you want to hit the tower, you know, like, a lot of towers have that. Tier 1s, Tier 2s, most of them have this little crevice. It's a beautiful way to do this. Uh, your Healing Ward is an aura, if you notice here. Watch my healing ward on me. So you say. It lingers. Giving yourself that extra bit of HP. So sometimes, because you give yourself that lingering effect, it might actually be worth to, in the middle of a mana battle, just do this. And let the guy spend one right click on your healing ward and it'll still give you that bit of healing. Uh, plus the one attack that he had to spend on the healing ward. This is like the most default carry I would tell anybody to practice if they're new to carry roll. It allows you to do everything. Survivably farm, split push, kill threat, everything you ask for a solo carry type hero. And it helps you learn the limits of playing aggressively and also like how to make sure you hold your abilities for survivability. Like sometimes if you spin, you walk up to a creep wave after you don't have spin, you're gonna die. Playing off this hero's cooldowns is very important. Whether or not that's Omni Slash for the kill threat on the map and you don't play passively, whether or not it's the 10 second downtime or 13 second downtime that your spin has once you use it and making sure you don't die in that meantime. I think Jug's all about that re-engage, disengage, re-engage, disengage, because he has that low cooldown magic immunity. Uh, and he has that healing ward for, for sustain. He has that reset in the fight. And I think uh, learning not to commit too hard is an important skill on Jug. Learning when to commit on Jug, very important. Uh, thinking about uh, exactly what you need in order to survive in fights. Sometimes it's that Manta, sometimes it's raw tankiness, sometimes it's that satanic to man up on somebody. You know, what is it that your hero needs? Sometimes you have to itemize to enable your Omni Slash, you know, with uh, the nullifiers and the abyssals and all that kind of stuff. Sometimes you just can't deal physical damage in that game and you have to go for the Radiance E-Blade uh, Manta build. You know, you have to go for that magic damage build. Jug is a lot about adjusting to the game that you're in. And he can oftentimes have numerous different builds, different skill builds, like in terms of maxing W or E. And also the threat of his Omni Slash is different every single game. Sometimes it wipes almost every hero on their team. Sometimes your Omni Slash does virtually nothing. And you have to wait till a very specific moment to use it. So that's what I love about Joe. He's all about adapting on the fly. He's all about figuring your way to make your hero useful in that given game. And that's why most of the time in most patches, even if the hero's not that great... You can still get away with picking him in the lower brackets especially, but also just knowing that you want to rinse and repeat items for a bit. You know, I told you the general formula for the ideal build for Jug, but there's a lot of situations that I've already mentioned that kind of throw him off of his ideal game. And adjusting according to those is like the best thing to do as a carry player. Like that's, that's a skill that's necessary on most heroes, but Jug is just so beautiful for understanding exactly how you do that and when you do that with items, with skills, with the way you play the map, etc. So that's what I love about Jug, and uh, that's why he's always been one of my favorite heroes to play. So uh, mechanically pretty simple to get used to, but in terms of theoretics, the way he plays the map, the way he uses his items, the way he approaches fights, those things are very advanced and very unique to every single game. And that's what makes Jug like a fun learning experience for someone like me. So... Hope you guys enjoyed the guide and that'll be it. It'll be up on YouTube for anyone uh, that's looking.